we uh, can, uh, you've got your Wi-Fi, you've seen all that stuff. Uh, here's us, our sponsor, Banks Rum, Mr. Jim Meehan, our Banks Rum's tireless uh, <laughs> ambassador roadman, uh, exemplar of the bank's life, uh, global traveler. Uh, we have Banks Five Island and Seven Island. Uh, how's the punch? Great. Excellent. We will talk about punch. Uh, here, uh, our vice admiral is actually missing. His plane has been reported overdue, and uh, we're going to send out search parties soon. But uh, in the meanwhile, uh, the rest of us are here. Uh, Jeff and I. Uh, Jeff Barry, a man who needs no introduction, if you've ever heard the word rum. And uh, if it ever started your heart going pitter pat, you know everything about Jeff. Uh, and uh, we're going to uh, talk a little bit about uh, drinking at sea. So uh, we'll start with our traditional brief introduction. The sea is cruel and you might die. Uh, this, the age of sail lasted for a long time and was extremely rough on the sailors. There's uh, no more dangerous job than sailor. Uh, the, the dangers were distance. Uh, some of these, to, to get from, say, England to uh, the south coast of India might take six months. There was no Panama Canal for mu much of that age. You'd have to sail around the south edge of South America or the south edge of South Africa. And you get into those lower latitudes, and the seas are high, the winds are, are, are brutal, and it was extremely dangerous. And if your uh, rudder breaks, uh, you can't go to the shop and get a new one. You've got to figure it out now or die. Those are your two choices. So sailors were extraordinarily resourceful, extraordinarily hardworking, unless uh, the, the next danger was disease. Uh, or the worst of all, you might spill your drink. Uh, high seas, tippy glasses, that's a very poor combination. Uh, I mean, we're fortunate to, to be here right now in the fairly stable Hotel Montleon. Uh, but uh, we'll, see, you know, we'll see what happens. Uh, it might start a rolling. Uh, yeah, uh, disease, scurvy uh, is something that we don't really have much of in America yet. Uh, it's, uh, we'll see. We seem to be in a race to scurvy, uh, uh, but uh, we'll, once they cut out the vitamin subsidies, we're all dead. Uh, <laughs> there are only two species of animal that uh, can't make their own collagen, human beings and guinea pigs. And uh, if you can't make collagen, what happens to your body? Things start falling out. Uh, your joints start loosening. Your internal organs start to sort of liquefy and you die a really nasty and lingering death. So it's like Tales of Day 3. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Friday morning at Tales Friday. <laughs> Everybody's got scurvy. Uh, but so it's a, an absolutely nasty disease that you know we don't really see much of. But in days where, you, where you're out of the sight of land for six months, uh, where are you going to get fresh vegetables? Where are you going to get vitamin C from? Uh, they didn't understand the, that whole thing about vitamin C either. They didn't know what caused it. They had various suspicions. However, there was an old sailor's cure. Uh, they knew that drinking punch uh, would probably ward off the scurvy and besides it made you very happy and we'll get to that. Um, okay, uh, you might spill your drink. Uh, that's important to a sailor because sailors always like to drink. This is from the 1790s, the sailor's pleasure. He's got uh, gold from, from the prizes that his ship captured, pieces of gold he's been paid off. He's got his bowl of punch and he's smirking a lot. Uh, if we uh, skip forward to the next slide, that's from uh, uh, 1943. Uh, he's added the, the, uh, the extra uh, sailor's delight of female companionship. Uh, and uh, there they are celebrating New Year's Eve. Uh, also, the passengers like to drink. Yes, they do. Thank you. <laughs> See? We'll get I have it on no better authority than Mr. Jeff Barry. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll be getting to that in a minute, but the, the whole notion of passengers um, was just complete science fiction up until 
uh, about 100 years ago. Nobody wanted to be on a boat unless they absolutely had to be, and there was absolutely no other way they could possibly get anywhere else. So the notion of actually having a drink and relaxing in a luxury liner was just, you know. No, it was all business travel. Yeah. There, was, there, was, there was no tourist class. OK, uh, splice the main brace. Uh, we're going to, uh, in a little bit, uh, attempt to issue you guys the grog ration, and we'll see how that goes. It's going to be a little interesting. But uh, how do you get drinks at sea? You've got to bring them with you, right? You can't just uh, distill them out of seawater and, and uh, seagull feathers. You've got to really actually like plan ahead. Uh, we could talk about all nations of the world, uh, but we'll, we'll focus on the English just because we only have so much time. Uh, English sailors in the 1500s, they didn't really, the Spanish and the Portuguese were sailing the long voyages around the world, making the, the journeys of expo exploration. Only a couple of English uh, people attempted that until the end of the very end of the 1500s, when under Queen Elizabeth, they chartered the uh, British East India Company and fitted up a fleet and sent it down to India to see what they could uh, either buy or take at gunpoint, uh, whatever, whatever wasn't nailed down or whatever was only loosely nailed down that you could knock out with cannons. Uh, and that was the basic plan. So they, they got this fleet and they start sailing. And uh, the English were good sailors, but they were good sailors in very restricted northern waters. They sailed to the Baltic. They sailed down to Spain. That was about it. They didn't sail far. Uh, and suddenly they run into a really serious problem. Each English sailor was, uh, had an allowance of a gallon of beer a day. And it wasn't a regular gallon, it was a beer gallon. The difference was it had an extra quart. Uh, why is that? What happens when you pour beer into a container? Head. Head. Nobody wanted that to come out of their share. <laughs> you know, why should that, that that's not my problem. I, I get a gallon of beer, not a gallon of beer plus foam. So uh, the, the beer quart or the beer gallon was an extra quarter on top of that. So you know everybody's getting basically uh, 10 pints of beer a day, uh, which is, that's a pretty reasonable amount. <laughs> uh, not by tails and cocktail standards, but, but you know, by ordinary workday standards. Uh, that's OK. Uh, that works great uh, if you're sailing you know, across the Irish Sea or over to Copenhagen or something like that. But when you get off the coast of Nigeria, uh, after you've been uh, a sea for a couple months and it's hot and you start opening those barrels, you know, the beer is in barrels, it's not pasteurized, it's not refrigerated, it's not sterilized, it's just live beer in barrels. And they start opening it up and there's stuff inside. Uh, one of those, uh, People said after a long sea posting uh, that, that the men, uh, the sailors, were unhappy because they opened the barrels of beer and there was stuff inside that looked like men's guts. You can only imagine what the bacteria does. It's just these big ropey strands of just disgustingness. So, okay, there's no beer. That goes. Uh, wine, uh, the gentlemen, the officers drank wine. They were each allowed to ship their own barrels of it, and they would several barrels each, because uh, you know they were going through quarts a day of wine, easily, several. Uh, and uh, suddenly, that's the only alcohol left on the ship, and that gets shared out pretty quickly. Uh, then, or they hoard it, and then they get thrown overboard, because uh, nobody likes uh, somebody like who does that. And wine goes sour, too. The wine goes sour, good. too, exactly. Yeah. That doesn't last either. What's left? Uh, eventually, the English discovered uh, uh, something that other people had had an inkling of. By the end of the 1500s, the English had started uh, taking on as provisions for going at sea little barrels of aqua vitae, distilled spirit. The English weren't a spirit drinking nation, but uh, they uh, they learned that you know, like like the old saying is, hard times make a monkey eat red peppers. It's like, uh, here we are sailing on the sea and nothing else works. And we've got this medicinal spirit that you might get a teaspoonful of if you were feeling poorly. And maybe we can turn that into something. I mean, even like Shakespeare in, in Comedy of Errors, he has uh, people talking about provisioning a ship. And one of the special supplies for the sea voyage is aqua vitae. That's one of the earliest uh, appearances in English literature of distilled spirits. And uh, 
And it was, so they start turning that into punch uh, if they can. And we'll talk about punch in a little bit. But uh, this leads to uh, an official spirits ration for the British, uh, for the British Navy. Uh, by uh, the 1650s, they start issuing it on the Jamaica station when they've got ships there. There's a, the whole 1600s is naval, naval fights in the Caribbean. I mean, the whole century and all, the whole seven, 1700s too. The, the Caribbean is like just this basically uh, free for all. It's like rollerball down there. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody's sailing around shooting cannons at each other almost indiscriminately. And uh, England captures Jamaica, which had started making rum under the Spanish. And uh, they start provisioning their ships with rum, which is uh, pretty good. Uh, because that is opposed to everything else, all the other alcohol that's available, the beer and the wine, that stuff actually improves in barrels at sea. And uh, it does not go bad. And uh, you can actually drink it. You can turn it into punch or something else. Or you can just drink it in drams. Uh, they're getting, by 1731, English sailors on foreign station are getting uh, uh, half a pint a day of strong rum, uh, issued either at once or in two, gull in, in two shots, and they're drinking it in drafts down the hatch. So uh, they were nursing it. Yeah, no. Four, <laughs> so if you if you got uh, four ounces a day, four ounces at a time of strong rum, that's enough to get you a little bit tipsy. Yeah. <laughs> Happy hour lasted about thirty seconds. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, they're trying this uh, and. Uh, you know, their officers start to think that there might perhaps be a better way. So in uh, 1740, Admiral <coughs> Edward Vernon, hero of Portobello, one of those interminable naval battles, in August 21st, 21st 1740, he issues an order uh, that the sailors, quote, their half pint of rum to be daily mixed with a quart of water so that they can't chug it all down like that, which they that are good husbandsmen may, from the saving of their salt provisions and bread, purchase sugar and limes to make more palatable to them. Uh, so he says, OK, we're going to mix it with water. And if you want, you can add sugar and limes. We'll get to that. But uh, the water part, uh, this mix gets a name. His nickname was Old Grogram, because he always wore this big Grogram, which is a type of heavy cloth cloak, right? <coughs> and by 1749, uh, you find in the, uh, in the Jamaica Gazette uh, somebody talking about uh, shipboard conditions and saying, but short allowance of grog was worst of all. So this stuff becomes known as grog almost immediately. And grog is that watered rum. Uh, Vernon had it issued two servings a day, mixed in a scuttled butt, as it was known, which was a barrel with the top knocked out, much like this one. Uh, in the presence of an officer, uh, Mr. Meehan, if you would report to the bridge, uh, and uh, to make sure that the men are not defrauded. You're going to be the tribune, the tribune for our sailors here. All right, uh, we're going to do this. We're going to issue a ration of grog to every man and woman jack of you. Uh, and we'll see what happens. Uh, nobody has done this uh, in quite a while. This is, uh, this is uh, the, the Royal Navy stopped doing this in 1972? 70, I think. Uh, yeah, 70, maybe 72, 76, I can't remember. 70? Yeah, and so anyway, it's been, it's been a while. Okay, uh, would uh, Mr. Barry, if you don't mind? Yes, sir. Up spirits, sir. All right, up spirits. Uh, we will be issuing grog. Uh, first, we have to divide you into watches. The ship always had two watches: the port watch and the starboard watch. Uh, everybody from you know the, we here at the bridge. The bow is behind you, so you people are all on the on the port side. Are all, all the port watch? You people are all the starboard watch. The port light is always green. You can tell you've got green lights at the end of your, uh, red lights at the end of your table, <laughs> and green lights at the end of your table. Port watch is always red, excuse me. The starboard watch is always green. I always get my right and left mixed up when I get excited about grog. Um, OK. Uh, furthermore, each, we're going to have to divide you further into messes. Who's in your mess? 
everybody at your long table. Uh, you in the back are unfortunately super cargo or uh, <laughs> prisoners and rabble. We'll get to you at the end, but uh, in the meanwhile, so every, every table is a separate mess because the way it worked in the Royal Navy, the, 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 you'd have a group of men uh, and they'd all cook their food together and get draw their drink together, et cetera, et cetera. It was a way of dividing things up. Okay, yeah, even that guy. Uh, <laughs> so you're all in it together. Uh, welcome to the Navy. Um, okay, each mess has a cook or a rum bosun, as they were known, and that's the person on the end. That's that's you, uh, for instance, because you've got the uh, the cup, the cups, and the uh, the little cups. Uh, if there's anybody on the, one of the ends who doesn't want to do this, that's okay. Pass it to the person next to you. But we're going to have you line up here and draw <coughs> the, the rum for your, the grog for your mess and bring it back and pour it out for them. Dave, I think you should point out there are no emergency exits. You can't. There are no emergency exits. We're at sea here. <laughs> we're in the Navy. Uh, not yet. Not yet. Hold on. <laughs> Come on. This is a Navy, goddammit. This is not a cruise ship. <laughs> Everything is organized. <laughs> First, we have to mix the grog. Okay, so cooks, just hang out. Uh, we're going to do it by watches. We're going to have you line up with your fannies, as they were known, and we'll tell you why. Uh, and it's, it's, it's weird. <laughs> so shall we start filling this? Yes, sir. Uh, we have our rum. Uh, these are authentic Royal Navy rum cups. Uh, permission to speak, sir? Please. Well, this is a 90-minute seminar, and this might take a little time. Do we have an alternate method, uh, Well, well what, if, what if we use this? I, that's <laughs> All right, and that's a rum cup. This is a Victorian uh, Imperial Gallon. The Imperial Gallon was that same size as the beer gallon, so it's five quarts. We're going to fill it up with rum, and uh, then we're going to make our grog. This takes a little bit of rum in here. Just a little. Yeah, just about. <laughs> this is gonna this is gonna take a while. All right, now it, this holds six bottles of rum to the ounce. Yeah. Now the hard part, the part I've been I've been afraid of. Can you, you got it? I do. Now they didn't put a rim on it because they didn't want they wanted to that if you kept pouring rum in they wanted to spill over the side and into the grog tub uh, so that the sailors were not defrauded of their rum by it like landing on the rim or anything like that. But anyway, okay, sandy bottoms there as they used to say. Uh, now, the problem is Royal Navy rum was a little stronger than, than Bank 7, a lovely rum that we will discuss in a moment. Royal Navy rum was at Navy strength, which is not 57% as popular mythology has it, but it was at 54.5%, uh, so 109 proof. And that means uh, there's more, we need more alcohol in here. So we're going to have to add another liter of rum. I've done the math, which is complicated, because you have to, uh, so uh, that's about right, yeah. Look at that. Okay. So far, we've got the rum. Now we have to turn the rum into grog. Uh, <laughs> I know. See, indiscipline in the ranks. That's the whole reason we make for our, for our drinking. We've only got three gallons of water here, three U.S. gallons, not imperial, to, uh, to uh, account for the uh, difference in proof. Uh, this has all been mathed out, believe it or not, <laughs> by an English major. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, draw your own conclusions. Draw your own conclusions. Now, okay, the grog must come down off the bridge. I'm bringing it over. Now, 
<laughs> now we have a chief petty officer here who will, uh, all right, now will the port watch, the red watch, please line up the, uh, uh, with, with the, the rum bosuns, come forward, stand in line. Uh, count, uh, before you come up, count how many people are in your mess. Make sure to count yourself. And if you're really slick, you'll count yourself twice. <laughs> All right, now, uh, Jim, you take that. And, and yep, uh, and this is going to run itself. Uh, when you get back, when the rum bosuns get back, you're going to pour this much grog into each person's cup until right under the NOCCPS. And that is each person's ration. Not a drop more, not a drop less. <laughs> uh, <laughs> all right. Uh, so far, so good, right? We're all good? OK. Uh, yep. Uh, you've got, oh, it's, it's, it's supposed to look like this. And you know what? It looks like this. <laughs> all right, then. <laughs> well done, sir. <laughs> Uh, not so bad. Now these are called fannies. Originally, they're these big tin cans because there was a uh, piece of uh, there was a sensational uh, piece of British Navy folklore that a, a woman called Fanny Adams had been murdered, cut into pieces, and canned. And so a tin can was called a Fanny Adams, or a Fanny for short. And these were tin uh, these were like tin buckets that they they drew the grog in, and. Uh, so anyway, you've got your fannies, red and green, and uh, once uh, this watch is done, we'll go on to the next one. Okay, now a little bit more history. Uh, shall we move on? The East India Company and the invention of punch. We talked about uh, British sailors being out and about and uh, running out of drink and learning maybe to drink spirits. The problem is spirits are concentrated and if you're doing shots, the spirits go very quickly, and uh, everybody gets drunk very quickly, and it's it's sort of a problem. So, uh, and it doesn't taste very good. This is before we had lovely stuff like this Banks rum, a blend of rums. Uh, uh, Jim, where are the rums in this from? That was Trinidad, Jamaica, Barbados, Guiana, Java, with the addition of Guatemala and Trinidad. Okay, so it's. Basically, it's Trinidad, Jamaica, Barbados, Guatemala, oh yeah, Panama, uh, Guiana. These are all places that the uh, British used to buy rum from, or almost all of them. There are a couple extras in there. But it's a blend, this, this blend tastes pretty much like Navy rum used to taste. It's just maybe a little lighter in the, in the alcohol because it's not being diluted by three parts water uh, normally. Uh, but uh, this style of rum uh, was was very popular uh, in you know and very stable in the British uh, in the British firmament. Uh, Navy rum was pretty much the same from the early 19th century up until the 1970s. Uh, there are only a few purveyors. Uh, a guy by the name of Lemon Hart, act actually uh, Asher. Laman Ben Eliezer Hart from Penzance, a, a Cornish Jew, uh, was the rum purveyor to the British Navy from 1811 until like the 18, until he died, and then his sons carried on until 1870, and then it was taken over by the firm of E. F. Mann and Company, uh, who uh, provided rum until they got rid of the rum ration, whereupon they promptly went into finance, and now it's one of the biggest arbitrage countries and companies in the world <laughs> is EF Man, the, uh, the rum broker. But anyway, so uh, that's with good rum. The East India Company didn't have that. They had raw spirits, they had arak from Indonesia, they had coconut arak from uh, India and Sri Lanka, they had Bengal arak made out of, of fairly rank molasses. Uh, so they learned to drink it mixed. Uh, they came up with a smart idea of turning it back into wine by adding citrus and sugar and water and maybe a little spice because they like spice in their wine. And uh, this becomes punch. The first mention of it is in a letter back from India in 1628. 
but it might be a little earlier than that because uh, there was a drink that an Italian traveler, Pietro della Valle, found the English drinking over there that they called Larkin. And it's one of those great moments of uh, coitus interruptus in drink history. Because <laughs> he, in, in his memoirs, he writes in Italian, he says, they make this fabulous drink based on spirits, and it's uh, molto gagliarda, very uh, sort of, uh, I don't know, uh, gentlemanly, uh, adventurous, like uh, gay and potent. And he says, and I'm bringing the recipe home with me. And he doesn't put it in his letters. <laughs> and I don't know what happened to that recipe. But I'm pretty sure it was punch. Because the English had already started, uh, it had already started spreading pretty early on. This was already by like 1611. Uh, uh, starboard watch, if you will uh, report to the bridge with your fannies in hand. <laughs> that, that came out right. <laughs> that was fine, right? <laughs> So any, anyway, uh, this punch stuff spreads around very rapidly from the English to the Dutch to the French, all the people sailing around the Indian Ocean and then sailing across the Atlantic because they, they go home, they get paid off, they go on new ships, and they all make this drink, and this becomes, punch becomes the sailor's drink. Like grog is fine, but punch is like the gentlemanly one. Uh, the Royal Navy, uh, just a couple very brief anecdotes here. Uh, in 1685, Henry uh, Tong uh, is a chaplain on the, uh, on the assistance, the HMS assistance. He's a landsman, like from central England, and he shows up on this boat, and it turns out that uh, there's this, new, this drink that everybody's drinking punch. He's never heard of it. He gets hideously drunk his first night on, on board in the Navy, his first night in the Navy. And then it goes on. Uh, off Gibraltar, uh, the captain has a party. His liquors were canary, canary wine, sherry, Rhenish, so Rhine wine, claret, Bordeaux, white wine, cider, ale, beer, all of the best sort, and punch like ditch water, meaning it flowed like ditch water. Just like punch, 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 punch. This is crazy. Uh, in 1721, the HMS Exeter, another Navy ship uh, in the Indian Ocean, was described by one of her sailors as one of the most noble punch houses in the sea. <laughs> <laughs> Things got a little out of control with drinking punch. They not only had the rum ration, they also drank a lot of punch. Uh, so hence, uh, Admiral Vernon suggesting that, you know, the, the smart sailors could turn it into punch. And in fact, in 1797, after they did enough scientific research to realize that citrus actually does cure scurvy and prevent scurvy, they uh, started turning the rum ration automatically into punch. Yeah, that was 40 years, in typical military fashion. Yeah. 40 year lag time, a Scottish surgeon, James Lynn, figured that out, and it took the uh, Navy 40 years to implement and it. And like in uh, 16... 10, one of the East India Company's captains knew that you they, needed citrus that far. So, and needed it so much that he sailed back, halfway back across the Indian Ocean to get citrus. Huh. Uh, so, you know, because they'd run out. Uh, so, yeah, it's, the sailors knew. Yeah. They always knew. With they, the brass. Yeah, yeah they're, they're, the scientists were like, no, it's not that. It's not <laughs> that. Uh, we have the Purser's, Purser's Journal from the HMS Victory, uh, Admiral Nelson's, uh, later Admiral Nelson's ship. The one that, you know, he died on at Trafalgar after winning the battle. Uh, and there's a note from it in 1797 when they said you have to move to punch. And he says, began to use the standard weights and measures and served the ship's company with punch for the first time as follows. 24 gallons brandy, 72 gallons water, 6 pounds lemon juice, 15 pounds sugar. Not a lot of lemon juice in that punch. <laughs> it's not a tiki drink. <laughs> I might put a little more. But nonetheless... It's okay. a tiki drink at certain locations yeah. we won't name. So it's six pints, to de yeah. <laughs> six pints of lemon juice, like a pound is about a pint, to 24 gallons brandy. That's, uh, that's a little low on the citrus. Uh, but anyway... Uh, other drinks, just to finish up here, uh, there's a wonderful book called The Recollection, Recollections of James Anthony Gardner, who uh, was a uh, 
in the Royal Navy from 1775 up until 1814, retired and wrote his very chatty and frank and uncensored memoirs about life in the Royal Navy. Uh, there were a lot of drunks in the Royal Navy. Uh, grog drunks, wine drunks, brandy drunks, gin drunks. There was Mr. Quinton, mate of the Orestes, one of the ships he was on. This gentleman was a good sailor and very fond of gin grog and used to say it agreed with him so well and made his flesh so firm. It was determined one day among the uh, midshipmen uh, to count how many glasses he drank from morning until evening. And if I remember correctly, 26 tumblers of good Hollands, Holland gin, and water made the number. For in the good old times, we never sported Cockney gin. Uh, they didn't drink English gin. That was crap. They drank the good stuff, the Dutch gin. I must in justice declare Mr. Quinton was no drunkard. I never saw him disguised with liquor the whole time I belonged to the ship. <laughs> so as long as you were just like tipsy, fine. You were no drunkard. Uh, is that it? Uh, how much ullage do we have left there? All right, do you have some for, uh, you know, as it says in scripture, muzzle not the ox as he treadeth out the corn. <laughs> so, uh, let, us, uh, let us make sure that we have uh, some for us. And then uh, some for the, uh, we, we even have enough for the supercargo and the deck passengers in the back. So uh, we'll fill up some fannies for them. And if you wouldn't mind bringing them back there uh, with some cups. Mr. Barry, Dr. Wondrich. Ah, thank you. Uh, how's, how's the grog? Watery. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers. Uh, you know, this is so that we can, we can get a good day's work out of you. The queen, God bless her. The queen, God bless her. <laughs> so, that tastes right. That this tastes was basically the only few minutes of a sailor's life in the great age of sail that was at all pleasant. Um, and uh, there was one Salem merchant ship um, captain who described the experience as sailors likened being at sea to being in prison with the added possibility of drowning. <laughs> <laughs> and especially when you were working in merchant ships that came out of Salem, Massachusetts, which were all owned by Puritans. Uh, Puritans actually, there's a quote, uh, church organs were the devil's bagpipes. They didn't even like music. So the idea <laughs> of, uh, of relaxing with a little rum on board was just anathema to them. Plus, it meant that that's five minutes you weren't working. Um, so what are you going to do? I mean, you obviously, you can't just get by on this in a 24-hour period. Sailors got creative, both in the Merchant Marine and in the Navy. Um, one of the things that they did to get around their meager ration of rum was called sucking the monkey. <laughs> That's a monkey. <laughs> now, um, on merchant and military ships, they would often have naturalists on board in the 17th and 18th centuries to take specimens of new world flora and fauna and bring them back to the universities of London, Paris, um, uh, Stockholm, and they would just turn them into taxidermy. But the only way to preserve them back then was to preserve them in alcohol. So you had your, um, <laughs> the naturalist would like bag the primates, stick them in a barrel with alcohol, and um, hmm, I finished my rum. There's a big barrel full of booze over there. So this process Hello. of putting a straw in the bung there was, Thank you. became known as sucking the monkey. <laughs> and. Um, you know, <laughs> after you get lucky, some people like a cigarette. You know. um, there was another way that sailors got a little bit more than their allotted taught, and that was known as tapping the admiral. <laughs> this practice began with the death of Admiral Nelson, killed at the Battle of Trafalgar, a great British military hero. They wanted to preserve his body and bring it back for a proper burial um, on the island. And yes, they did preserve it in a cask of brandy. Some historians say rum. So you had the admiral in uh, brandy or rum. Again, same deal. The uh, story goes that when the uh, cask got back to England and it was opened up, there was absolutely no spirits <laughs> left in there. It leaked. Yes. Now, we do have 
our own little myth buster here to tell us uh, that uh, this was not necessarily the truth. I personally prescribe to it. I have drunk with members of the US Navy, and I'm here to tell you that both of these practices are entirely plausible. Entirely plausible. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but, Absolutely. Uh, but there are those who say that sucking the monkey was actually uh, just a phrase that sailors used. A monkey was sort of slang for an empty coconut. Um, or any other kind of vessel that you drank out of. Uh, during the Revolutionary War, British sailors would often bribe West Indian women who were selling coconuts uh, to them before they disembarked. Uh, they would just bribe them to empty out the coconut water and refill it with rum so they had a little something. They had their monkey on board and they would suck that. This is the improved uh, tiki grog. Oh, all right. Would you like to say a word about this? Yes, um, very briefly, um, and a little bit apropos because uh, Ernest Raymond Beaumont Gant, alias Don the Beachcomber, who created this version of the drink, did spend a lot of time at sea. Uh, he went around the world twice working on merchant ships in the 1920s, exposed himself to different forms of drinking in uh, the new and old world. And um, his version of the Navy Grog, he sort of tiki-fied this 200-year-old recipe. And by tiki-fied, I mean tiki drinks are basically Caribbean drinks squared or cubed. So in this case, instead of one citrus, he put two in, lime and grapefruit. Um, and he squared it. And instead of um, just sweetening with honey, he again, he excuse me, instead of sweetening it with uh, sugar, he sweetened it with uh, honey and a little allspice liqueur. So you had your, your two sweeteners. And he did the same thing. In a sense, he was doing what Persians had been doing for hundreds of years. He blended the rum together. But in his case, instead of just like, oh, OK, which colonies produce rum? Let's put it all together, South Africa, whatever, whatever's cheap, whatever we can get um, on consignment. What he did was he very, very deliberately chose rums of different body character uh, and, and flavor to mix them together, get a base spirit that just tasted better than any three you could get, which is not necessarily what they were doing in the Navy during these no. 300 years. So they just wanted it to be strong and, yeah. uh, well, if the rum was really bad, sailors were, were unhappy and it was bad for morale, so it had to be reasonably it good. It had to be, yeah, somewhat good. Um, of course, there's always the take what you can get philosophy, mm -hmm. but um, long story short, he cubed the rum. In instead of just one rum, he put in three. Um, I don't know if we've done that with the banks, but we've got seven in the bottle, so we went on a few times better. Um, so, uh, yeah, it wasn't just sailors, you know, it wasn't just the Navy that was at sea. Again, uh, in the age of sail, there really were very, uh, very few tourists. There were passenger ships, the packets that went back and forth, but usually it was freight or it was uh, the other fleet, privateers and pirates. Uh, I just wanted to read a little speech to you to, that emphasizes in part the importance of uh, drink in the life of a pirate or privateer. A, a privateer is a pirate with a license. Uh, <laughs> there were a lot of wars. They couldn't build enough warships. So they'd tell people, all right, as long as you, you know, you're an English person, as lo we'll give you an English letter of patent that says as long as you don't attack English people, you can go off and be a pirate all you want, only attacking you know, our enemies. Uh, some people interpreted that very loosely. Uh, <laughs> this is from 1609, uh, a report of Captain Ward the pirate. Uh, Captain Ward ended up being a uh, Barbary pirate for the, uh, and converted to Islam and, uh, uh, and, and had a hell of a career. But uh, this is a reported speech. I don't know if it was actually his speech uh, by a guy who uh, claimed to have been uh, involved uh, you know, on his ship. Uh, but here they are, times are a little low in the privateer business or the pirate business, and he says, uh, my mates, what's to be done? Here's a scurvy world, and as scurvily we live in it. We feed here upon the water on the king's salt beef without ear a penny to buy us bissel. Nobody knows what bissel <laughs> means. Uh, when we come ashore, it's probably drinks. <laughs> here's brine meat good for ravening stomachs, but where's your brim cup? and your full carouse that can make a merry heart. Where are the days that we cried cargo in? Uh, where are the times that we sailors esteemed chickens cheaper than your bumber Hollander Dutch cheese? Where are the Portugal voyages that could put Portuguese sovereigns into our pockets? This blood, what would you have me say? 
where are the days that have been and the seasons that we have seen when we might sing, swear, drink, drab, that means whore, uh, and kill men as freely as your cake makers do flies. <laughs> when we might do what we wish and the law would bear us out in it. Nay, when we might lawfully do that that we shall be hanged for, and we do now. When the whole sea was our empire, when we robbed at will, and the world but our garden where we walked for sport. That's a speech, goddammit. <laughs> here, here. Is that, you know, all right. That kind of makes the pirate life for me. <laughs> it's like, woo. Uh, then you, you get, like... Uh, Rome was, uh, there's a famous excerpt from uh, Blackbeard's journal, Ed Edmund Teach, it was like day one or day X, such a day, it says in the, in the diary, because they didn't put the day in. Uh, it said, rum all out, our company somewhat sober, a damned confusion amongst us. <laughs> Rogues applauding, great talk of separation. So I looked sharp for a prize. Then another day, took one with a great deal of liquor on board, so kept the, the company hot, damned hot. Then all things went well again. <laughs> and then finally, just another uh, little bit. Oh, well, there's Ned Lowe, the pirate, uh, that guy. Uh, he was uh, not a nice man. And when he captured gentlemen, uh, he was a pirate from New England uh, where you know, the people tend to be a little uh, somewhat touch, tough and practical and maybe not super, uh, super friendly. Uh, he uh, would hold the gentleman in front of him and uh, stand in front of him with a punch bowl in one hand and a pistol in the other. As you can see. Uh, dramatized for you there. Punch, goblet of punch, pistol, and say, drink with me, either the bowl or the, uh, or yep. the pistol. Now, a gentleman would not drink with a pirate. That was really humiliating. You know, that was like, that was like saying, I'm your bitch. Uh, I mean, seriously, it was, it was really bad. And so the, here's the guy, it's like pistol or the punch ball. They always took the punch, but uh, <laughs> nonetheless, it was, uh, it was sort of nasty. Uh, finally, uh, there's the, uh, an amazing tale from William Snellgrave, who was a, uh, a slaver, so not a nice man, uh, captured by pirates off the coast of Guinea in 1733. Uh, and uh, he and the, his whole crew were prisoners on this pirate ship they weren't locked up or anything. They just, you know, uh, they couldn't get off. And uh, they were being held for ransom. Well, the pirates got to drinking. And they sent one of the pirates down into the hold to get some more rum with a candle. Uh, he starts pumping out of the barrel. Uh, and it's dark down there. And he moves the candle a little close. Woof! Flame shoots out of the bung. And the, the barrel next door, the bung, you know, the little hole in it, the, the next barrel, that bung would have been left out by the person who was there. And there's rum vapor everywhere. Boom. Uh, suddenly there's a fire. There's a big fire down in the rum hold. And the pirate runs out. And uh, the rum hold is next to the gunpowder hold that has uh, 30,000 pounds of gunpowder in it. And uh, the pirates are all up, up on, on the main deck drunk. And the pirates aren't going to do anything about this. Uh, they, he hears a cheer from the main deck, our, our Captain Snellgrave, saying, Huzzah for a brave blast to go to hell with. <laughs> <laughs> so the pirates are like, fuck it off. <laughs> Let it go. We don't care. No, we're good. <laughs> It'll be a hell of a blast. <laughs> and, uh, and, and meanwhile, the, the, the prisoners like run around like crazy, like wetting blankets and throwing it over the rum barrels and getting burns all over their arms and they put the fire out. Meanwhile, the, the soberer pirates have climbed out to the end of the yard arm uh, just in case it blows up. Not that that will save them. And it's a hell of a scene anyway. So pirates. Mm. <laughs> Uh, all right, we, yeah, we've done this. That, done, that done went that. very well, actually. I believe it did. So let's, Jeff, you want to talk about passengers? I will talk about passengers. Um, this, again, as, as we mentioned at the top of the hour, the idea of taking a pleasure cruise, as this 1895 advertisement, a 60-day tour through the Azores, the idea of that, up until the invention of the steam engine, was just complete fantasy. Nobody went to sea unless they were working on a ship or they absolutely had no other way to get where they needed to go. It was a miserable experience. 
Um, the steam engine changed all that. Um, in the beginning, steamers were a combination of sail and like side paddle wheel steamers. You can see one from around circa 1860s. This one uh, is the unloading on the docks of Kingston, Jamaica. Um, the writer W. Sewell took this ship from Manhattan to Kingston and he described it in Harper's Weekly in 1861. Our cabin, about the size of a church pew, was frequently full of water. <laughs> and our fare of salt pork varied by salt codfish was eaten thrice a day on the floor. My bunk was too wide. I believe the captain and his mate slept in it when there were no passengers. And I floundered from side to side like a live trout in a frying pan. My bones ached and my hips were black and blue. Um, at the end of the voyage, though, and during the voyage, if you had a you know, decently kitted out steamer, you would get something good to drink. In the 1860s, in the Caribbean, the drink of choice was the sherry cobbler. Uh, this was introduced to St. Croix, which was a ch transshipment center in the Caribbean for merchant ships. Almost everybody passed through St. Croix. Um, Danish, Spanish, American merchant vessels all did. Um, Anthony Trollope described it in 1859 after U.S. traders had introduced the sherry cobbler, which was sort of the drink du jour in New mm -hmm. York. As yeah, yeah. The, the warm weather drink of, of all warm weather drinks. Yes. Yeah, so, uh, as Mr. Trollope said, it is a Hispano Dano Yankee Doodle place <laughs> in which in which the Yankee Doodle element, declaring itself in nasal twang and sherry cobblers, seems to be of the strongest flavor. <laughs> so. The sherry cobbler is basically the it drink for a while um, until you started getting luxury liners coming into the Caribbean. Um, in the earliest 20th century, luxury liners were taking the sea out of seafaring, as one writer put it, um, by switching from side paddle wheels to screw propellers, which is where the abbreviation SS comes from, um, a screw propeller ship. You had a steadier ship. You can build it bigger. Um, it uh, was cut down your sailing time, and you could start kitting out your ship with the same luxuries you had at home. Um, in the case of the uh, Ile de France, or the SS France, which cruised the Caribbean for most of the 20th century, um, they had the first and only, as far as I've been able to uncover, famous bartender who got written up as the, a, as the cruise ship bartender. This was a guy named Raymond Cordier, a Frenchman, uh, who was profiled twice in Gourmet Magazine, once in 1973, a little later, uh, as they wrote, after starting as a page boy on the SS France in 1932 at age 13, it took him 25 years to become the French line's first barman. Now his little empire is the Riviera bar of the SS France. His bar is organized like a piano, with the bottles representing the keys. <laughs> one has to be so well organized that one never gropes for something, says Monsieur Courrier. I keep talking to a passenger, looking at him while I work with the bottles. Sounds like a, a pretty good craft cocktail bartender to me. Yeah. Um, now, at this point, the article gets a little weird because he claims to have invented the mimosa and the Bloody Mary. Um, and he, yeah. Also, yeah, he also claims to have invented this drink, the Bullshot, which was a very, very popular, if very weird, drink on the French line. Yeah, Lester Gruber would have kicked his ass from, <laughs> yeah. from Detroit. Uh, a lot of people would have kicked his yeah. ass. Yeah, do you want, Dave, do you want to talk about the actual origins of the uh, Very shot? quickly, yeah, it was, it was invented by an advertising guy and Lester Gruber. Uh, this guy was selling, ca uh, was uh, working for an advertising agency in Detroit in like 1952, and he had the Campbell's Bouillon ac account, and he couldn't figure out how to sell more Bouillon. And Lester Gruber, who had the famous Caucus Club and the, uh, the, uh, the London Chop House there, like the, one of the fanciest restaurants in America, one of the prime restaurants in America, a prime example of like a smart man in a rich market. Like really, you know, it's kind of like Burns Steakhouse or something, you know, it's, it's like this, this, this is just a place where everything is great. And uh, Lester Gruber says, uh, well, why don't you put vodka in it? <laughs> you know? And uh, so they make a Bloody Mary, except instead of tomato juice, it's, uh, it, it, it's uh, beef, bu uh, beef consomme, Campbell's you know, beef bouillon, and it, uh, uh, Campbell's doesn't use it. <laughs> <laughs> Why? Because probably, you know, we're a family, we're a family soup company. <laughs> we're, we're not going to have people we like sell hard soup. getting sozzled on our hard soup. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> was, it, uh, was, the, was the original name Ox on the Rocks? Uh, there were several names, but, yeah. it, but Bullshot, I think, was their name okay. originally. And, yeah. but, it, but it bubbles under for a couple of years, and by the late 50s, suddenly it's, 
It's one of those freak drinks that celebrities order when they go to places to seem sophisticated. A, a lot of that. celebrities. It was, it's, this is such an odd drink, and yet it was Noel Coward's favorite drink. Um, he had it when he went to the Savoy Hotel in mm -hmm. London, um, and it was always he ordered like one or two. Um, when he had um, the Queen herself to his place in Jamaica, his, uh, his Villa Firefly, he served her bull shots and she had two of them. All right. um, and, uh, well, you know who else likes it? Me and Dale DeGroff. Well, you and Dale DeGroff <laughs> and also Jackie Suzanne. There's a scene yeah. in Beyond the Valley of the Doll. Excuse me, the first. The whenever first, whenever yeah. we drink with her. <laughs> yeah, whenever you and Jackie get together. Um, if she just puts that poodle down for a second and yeah. she'll, she'll drink a bull shot. Um, but she had it in her book, The Valley of the Dolls. Uh, that was the uh, oh, that's funny. At the Peacock Alley in um, uh, oh, at, the, at the Waldorf. The Waldorf, yeah. Oh, that's funny. That's, that's funny. that's funny. That's crazy. Anyway, back to the sea. Um, so, so the the, um, the SS France, the French line was a transoceanic line, but the Grace line was more of a specialty thing, which happened after World War II when you had a, a nice, uh, robust post-war economy, and people started taking little pleasure cruises through the Caribbean, nice way to see the islands. And finally, as opposed to serving Bloody Marys and bull shots and mimosas, the cruise ships themselves would start serving drinks that were a little bit closer to home. Um, Cordier himself eventually adopted this practice, and he started serving a planter's punch variation called Punch Martinique. Of course, oh, it's a French good. line. So, yeah, uh, one part rum, lemon, orange, pineapple goes kind of uh, not dissimilar to what you might have had back in this old yeah. great age of sail, if you could yeah. get, get, gather a thing. <laughs> Garnish, odd little garnish, one drop of Angostura bitters. I'm sure that made a great visual impression. Mm -hmm. but, um, um, and then, then you had, um, sort of to get back to Tiki, you had this sort of weird thing going on in the 1960s in the Caribbean on cruise ships. Is there was, that was the age of what was called by the New York Times Hawaii in the Atlantic, where the Tiki drink thing was so big that it started influencing Caribbean drinks, which is weird, sort of like this weird feedback loop because Caribbean drinks influenced Tiki drinks. Anyway, they came back home to roost. And then you had something else thrown in here, uh, which we call the crushed ice age, when, um, when these tiki drinks got crossed with the industrial food complex, and you started getting the pool drink, the pool deck drink. Uh, this is what the USS Blender would have served uh, back in the day. You, have, uh, you would have put in some sweet and sour mix, syrup, doesn't matter what kind of syrup, red, blue, um, ice, rum, vodka, whatever, more ice. The, the garnish here is very important. That's the double finger point. Um, I will let the master of the double finger point demonstrate that for you. <laughs> you know, it, the first time I was in Trinidad, I was really excited. And I go to the, 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 the bar, the pool bar, at this, this and, and you know, I love Trinidadian rum, I love bitters and everything. And I asked for, for like their, their long swizzle, vodka swizzle, sweet and sour mix, yes. <laughs> red syrup. Did they, did they do the thing? Uh, almost. <laughs> they didn't do the thing. They, they, <laughs> see, they fucked up the garnish. <laughs> <laughs> but you don't like garnish anyway, so. Yeah, I don't like garnish anyway. Yeah. So, yeah. But everything else was exactly as you described yeah. in the blender. And I'm like, I don't know, what the hell? <laughs> so let's take a look at some actual ship's bars. Um, Starting in 1843, here's a very early example of what a steamship looked like. It's mostly a sail. It's mostly a sailboat. It's like mm -hmm. it's, it's just got one lonely smokestack in the middle there, which would have driven a side paddle thing. Um, and uh, for passengers in this in these days, as one traveler of the era said it, sea travel meant boredom varied with intervals of acute misgiving. Um, <laughs> Charles Dickens sailed on one of these in 1842, and he was like, as he put it, quote unquote, disgusted by having only brandy and water to drink with his hard biscuit. This is a, the interior of a saloon of a sailing packet ship of the period. This might have been what Dickens was sailing on. Um, oh. And you can see what the, this is the bar, this is the saloon. Basically, you have a big jug of water here, and uh, behind these gentlemen, hidden from them, would have been bottles of brandy. So it was a self-service bar. You helped yourself. You cut your, your brandy with the water, and you sat down and you drank it. Um, Richard Erdos described the practice in his, in his book, um, which is a great book um, about Western saloons, but he, ta he talks about seagoing as well. Quote, in places where the customer was left alone with a bottle to do as he saw fit, a man with pride poured himself three fingers of bug juice. He never filled his glass up to the rim. If he did, someone would re inquire solicitously whether he was taking a bath. 
some, some bartenders would hand you a towel <laughs> if you filled the glass Just drive, drive the point home. To go yeah. with your bath. Yeah. <laughs> now here's a little bit uh, later in the steamships slash sail era. This is a, a much nicer bar. Um, it's a kind of a real bar. You can, they even have some uh, nice amenities here, like railings, so that your drink doesn't spill onto the ground if you put it on the thing. This would have been where you get your drinks from. There would have been a bartender back there when the saloon doors opened up. I, I don't like the looks of that cuspidor down there. I was just going to say, like some vaudeville comedian strategically placed that cuspidor right there, because the only thing funnier than tripping over a, a banana peel is tripping over a spittoon. Um, <laughs> full of tobacco spit. <laughs> Good eyes, sir. Yeah, also that thing looks like, it looks a little tippy to me. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is cheating a little bit because these were not ocean-going vessels. These were riverine mm -hmm. um, steamers. But again, Erdos has a lot to say about these. And these did influence what happened on luxury liners later. Um, basically, your paddle, paddle wheel river boat. Um, this would have been around the, well, they started in the 1860s. Uh, yeah, this would have been pre-Civil yeah, pre yeah. War. They started in 1812 out of New Orleans, actually, up the Mississippi. Um, again, Richard Erdos. The paddle wheelers chugging along western rivers were also moving saloons. Alcohol on board was a necessity, not a luxury. Being proprietor of a bar on a popular packet was a surer way to wealth than possessing a gold mine. Bartenders knew how to mix cocktails and made brandy out of peach pits, nitric acid, cod liver oil, and raw Kentucky whiskey. So uh, here's Not the, the good one. Yeah, here's what these saloons looked like. It's pretty impressive. Um, this is by a New Orleans artist, actually, named Adrian Persack. It's a pre-Civil War boat saloon. Uh, the bar is at the right. You can see yep. the bar is open for business uh, with these gentlemen. And this was the reception desk. The saloon is not the word that we know it as today. This, the saloon would have also encompassed the dining room, the gambling room, the smoking room. The you can public see the, rooms, basically. Yeah. So you can see the long buffet table there. And then there would have been all of these booths in there where you could play cards and drink and smoke and now, all that good stuff. If I can interrupt for one Please. second. What, one of my favorite books of all time is this thing by this guy, uh, Duvall, D-E-V-O-L. I can't remember his first name. It's called 40 Years a Gambler on the Mississippi. And he wrote it in the 1880s. And oh my god, if you want salty Americana, that is the saltiest Americana. There's the time he got into the headbutting cont contest here in New Orleans. That is, uh, <laughs> is uh, an eye opener. That is one of the liveliest, sportiest books. It's, it's reprinted. It's available. It takes it's, off with a bang. You, you, you yeah. told me about the book. It's, it starts off with a, a bar fight uh, in Uptown in New Orleans on Chapatulas in 18-something or other. Oh, that's a different book. That's a different one. Oh. Yeah, that, that's the, uh, the, 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 the soldier of fortune who yes. founded the yes, okay. various South American air forces in the All 20s. All right. That's, uh, that's the incurable uh, filibuster by... That's, uh, that's right. Oh, I can't remember his name. God, he was, a, he was, a, he was <laughs> Dean Ivan Lamb. Another, another absolutely insane book. Yes. And a, and a good one, too. Real good one. Those are lively books. <laughs> yes. So here's the, this is an actual photograph of one of these things. And mostly what you did on these boats was gamble. Yeah. And what goes better with gambling than drinking? So, there was, so the, as, as Erdo said, bartending was a very lucrative procession on these, profession on these ships. So as I mentioned before, once you get to the screw propeller, this, so is the 19, this is 1900. This is the SS Potsdam, a propeller-driven steamship. You've got big, wide boats that don't go up and back and down and up, up, up and forth and back and down and, and spill your drink. You can start turning these into basically floating hotels, which is what liners became around 1900. Um, diesel engines made it even easier to do that. And here's like an example of a floating hotel bar. This is the SS France First Class Saloon in 1912. Um, they started to function like grand hotel saloons as well. Quote, the first luxury liners had a ratio of servers to served of about one to three. That's comparable to the grand hotels of pre-World War II Europe. The Cunard line had six barmen, but 112 assistant barmen. So wow. a whole, whole little army there. Yeah. Um, here's a, a partial wine list, 1920s, 1930s, the SS France. You see 71 different champagnes, 54 Bordeaux, eight sparkling wines, and then uh, 48 different Burgundies. A wine magazine creator at the time said that was a miserable number. <laughs> <laughs> this so, is nothing to drink on this boat. Nothing to drink. <laughs> so sta standards were high, and there were 81, 81 different whiskeys available on the SS France back then. Now we're getting into around 1948. This is the Queen Mary Midship Bar. 
It looks like any Manhattan hotel bar of the period. You wouldn't even know you were at yeah. sea. There aren't even any windows there. The curtains are covering those up. And this is the third class bar on the Hamburg American line in 1938. I would drink here. It's kind of yeah, cool. That's you know? all right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so now here, by the 1960s, the transatlantic liner was an anachronism. Nobody traveled by sea yeah. to get to Europe or to get to the States. You took a plane. Uh, it was the jet age. Mm. So jet aircraft was killing the seagoing passenger trade. And to lure the jet set back to sea, um, designers had to ramp up the chic factor in ever more swanky lounges to make that transatlantic crossing into something super glamorous and cool and, and, and aspirational. And also looking a little bit like the interior of an airplane. Absolutely, <laughs> like a 747 yeah, thing there. Right, yeah, right. yeah. So that's the QE2 in 69. Um, and here's, but now, of course, as with restaurants, the big profit center is the bar, and the same thing on an ocean liner. This would have been a huge profit center, but there was something siphoning away money at this point, and that was drinking in your room. Um, cabin parties were a big loss leader for cruise ships, um, and, but for the crew, this was a cottage industry in itself. A ship's photographer on the QE2 in the 1960s, William Scammell, kind of broke it down. He said, uh, passengers got waited on by cabin room stewards and stewardesses. The former mostly alcoholics, the latter refugees from boring marriages or broken engagements or lacerated hearts. <laughs> <laughs> stewards, when they ate, got cooked for and waited on by lesser stewards. Everybody got paid for their services either directly by the bloods, as passengers were called, or indirectly by those who had access to the bloods. So there's a whole, you know, multi-tiered yeah. eco little economy going on in these floating hotels. And in the 21st century, floating hotels turned into floating cities in order to get people back into the water. These massive things like this harmony of the seas. Um, and floating cities even had floating bars. Um, this bar on that very vessel goes up and down 10 stories, 10 decks. It's like sort of a floating bar. Right. You know, yeah. <laughs> and um, they're even introducing some of our own beloved practices onto cruise ships, this molecular mixology um, on the uh, Royal Caribbean, you know, uh, excuse me, Celebrity Cruises, 2007. Um, all of the effort that poor bartender is going through with a dry ice, they're not paying any attention to him at all. <laughs> <laughs> all she's, and she's not, she's pretending to pay attention to him, but really, if there was a thought balloon, it would be the royalty for the uh, stock photo um, yeah. thing that she's getting. I mean, they'll do anything to keep up with the times and to get people on ships. Uh, the Norwegian line now has an ice bar, you know, another kind of hip, cool thing. Now, given the often adversarial history between ice and cruise ships, I'm not sure what a good idea <laughs> that really is. Yeah, the ideation is not good. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, um, if you follow through with it. Um, so. uh, well, we're going to go very quickly over this part. <laughs> Back in the Navy, we're, we're tired of being in the Navy, but we've been <laughs> in the Navy. Uh, Sandy Bottoms, uh, that rum ration, uh, the, the grog in the 1930s, the Royal Navy did a study and found out that, in fact, grog tasted better if instead of three parts water, you only put two parts in. Who knew? Who knew? <laughs> I know. <laughs> You know, lightning bolts. <laughs> uh, so, uh, and the sailors developed over the centuries that they got a rum ration, they developed all these things, of, all these ways of gaming the system uh, where, like, you would uh, trade sips of your, of your grog uh, for, you know, favors or, you know, of any kind. Uh, and you know, there, there'd be sippers, there'd be a whole list of like how many sips all the way down to Sandy Bottoms, which is the end of, meaning you, they got to drink all your grog, the person you traded for. There was all this stuff, it was all very complicated. But the men, you know, were still drinking the rum ration. The officers, however, uh, and the officers mess, uh, to show that they were not enlisted men, they drank gin. And the mess paid for it themselves. It wasn't issued by the, the Navy. You know, in the real world, like, gin was for poor people, and rum uh, punch 
You know, in the 19th century, rum was for rich people because you drank rum punch, and punch it was was like the, the 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 social drink of the upper classes, and gin was the social drink of the lower classes. We're talking the 18th century. Uh, that flips around in the Navy very early on, where people are drinking pink gin. What was pink gin? It was gin and bitters. Now the gin then was uh, pre-sweetened. All, all English gin was consumed sweet, with sugar and, and, and water added. So it would be Plymouth gin, a sweetened, somewhat diluted Plymouth gin. It was Plymouth because uh, that was one of the big Navy bases, and uh, that was made there, so it was very popular in the Navy. There were other gins that made it into the Navy. But they're drinking uh, uh, basically that mixed with bitters, so it's uh, gin, sugar, water, bitters. What does that make? Gin Old Fashions. That was the original pink gin. In the 20th century, gin changed, and people got so stuck in their ways, they were making this with dry gin. How many people here have had a, a pink gin with uh, dry gin? Is that a tasty drink? No. no. <laughs> it's nasty. No. <laughs> it's a horrible drink. And it, but, it be, but it became a class marker, so they stuck to it, even though it was so bad. <laughs> you know, they're, they're drinking. And you, you, you see those, those sad... <laughs> SOBs there. They're not happy. <laughs> you know, the, the enlisted men are having a good time. They're all stuck on their on their good behavior. And you, you you get descriptions of like officers' wardrooms. Sometimes they were jolly. Other times they had so many customs that they had to be like some. If you were in port, uh, the uh, anybody could call on your ship. Any other officer from another ship could call on your ship, and then they'd have to be taken down to the wardroom and given a drink. And there were officers who only did that for their whole career. They, they, they lived in port, and they went from ship to ship drinking all day. You know, and they were complete alcoholics. And, and the other officers knew, but it was like, they can't break the system. Uh, we got to give them a drink. It's that guy again. It, we it, give it, him it is what drink. it is. Yeah. It is what it is. It's the Navy. You know, so it goes on and on. But anyway, uh, this final drink is, has an odd story. It's from this gentleman. Uh, Captain Harold Hopkins was the uh, liaison officer for the Royal Navy in the South Pacific uh, during World War II for a number of years. Uh, the Royal Navy, uh, after getting all of its ships sunk by the Japanese, did not go back into the South Pacific for quite some time. The, the U.S. Navy handled the Pacific, the Royal Navy handled the Atlantic. And, and other waters, and that was the division of labor between the Allies. But the Royal Navy figured as soon as we get those Germans sorted out, we will be back. So we got to send somebody to watch what the Americans are doing, see if maybe we could, not that we could learn anything, they probably wouldn't admit that, <laughs> uh, but just to see what they're doing, to monitor the for situation. For politeness' sake. Yeah, for politeness' sake. Uh, so uh, Harold Hopkins uh, goes over there and he lands in Washington and he gets a bunch of briefings, and as he told uh, the guy he was replacing, uh, I've already been briefed in London and Washington, and all that I've been able to find out is what an old-fashioned is made of. <laughs> because the Navy, uh, when they were on shore, all they did is drink, because American ships were dry. Uh, that meant that sailors, like the enlisted men, could sneak as much alcohol as they could get away with, but the officers had to set an example, and they were usually fairly close to this with exceptions. Uh, but they usually tried to be dry. Uh, so anyway, uh, Harold Hopkins, uh, and uh, Jeff, please, I, I'm going to miss details on this. Well, the, the, the main thing to know about uh, Captain Hopkins is that he was desperate to get intel and to, find, and to be useful. Yeah. He wanted to be useful. He wanted to win a war. But what he ended up being was he was bounced from ship to ship and island to island. He crisscrossed the 5,000 mm -hmm. square miles of the Pacific. Um, instead of gathering intel, he was gathering old-fashioned recipes. <laughs> and it's, it seems like. It started off in the Marshall Islands where he got Admiral McMorris' recipe and he got his, his, his orders. The only orders he ever got were to take this big sack of honey to the next island so that they well, could make old-fashions according yeah. to He goes, okay. <laughs> Admiral McMorris, so this guy, his nickname was Sock, short for Socrates, because everybody else, all of his classmates thought he was really smart. Uh, and, and yeah, he was uh, Charles McMorris. He was the chief of staff of the Pacific Fleet uh, in Honolulu. And uh, our guy goes to see him, and he wants to go up to the Aleutians to look around. But he really only wants to do that because it means transferring through San Francisco when he could see his wife. 
who was in San Francisco. So he says, all right, and, and, and Sock McMorris looks at him and says, no, I'm sending you back to the marshals. And uh, why? Well, I've got a package for Admiral Lee, who was commanding the fleet in the Marshall Islands in the Central Pacific. And well, the package was, as you said, it was like a huge can of honey. And it's like, wait, what? <laughs> what am I doing with this? A gallon is eight pounds, and I think it was like five gallons. Of yeah, it was like, like five eight. gallons. Yeah. It was like 40 pounds of honey. And, 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 and Sock McMorris says to him, well, the only way to make a good old-fashioned is with honey. <laughs> what? <laughs> It turns out the officers, when they were on land, uh, they really wanted to drink their old fashions. Now, they were drinking them with scotch because bourbon was unavailable throughout the war. Uh, but scotch, England was exporting lots of scotch for balance of payment also, purposes. As I understand it, the only way they can get a, even a hold of scotch was that the Army Air Force, who had planes on aircraft carriers, if you were an Air Force pilot, you got scotch. You got army issue scotch and that found its way to the uh, um, to the navy. Yeah, yeah. the navy side. Yeah, yeah. somehow. I yeah, the know. flyers, yeah, the flyers yeah. got got it as part of their their yeah. hazard pay. Hence uh, that, I I think reading between the lines that's why they were putting scotch in old fashioned. I, uh, I think that that makes sense. Yeah. And uh, so anyway, uh, Sock McMorris says to him, well, most people use sugar, but what a difference honey makes. Half a teaspoon per glass, mix with a drop of boiling water, and stir well. Then add the ice cubes and scotch. OK, boiling water? Well, uh, where are we going to get the boiling water? Well, you're going to be drinking these, and you can't drink them on shipboard. You're going to be having picnics with all the officers on the beach, and you're going to build a fire, and you're going <laughs> to boil the water so you can dissolve the honey to put into the scotch. And then uh, he's at a party a little later with uh, the fleet uh, surgeon Anderson, uh, who uh, pulls him aside and says, well, you know, that recipe's OK, but the real fix is you've got to put a, a few drops of rum in the drink. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that's what we have here. Is, uh, it's really uh, surgeon Anderson's uh, uh, old fashioned. But this is the Pacific Fleet old fashioned of World War II. And it's a long way from the Marshalls to the Aleutians. So this, yeah. drink, this drink is a true trans a true, Yeah, it is. And it's, you know what? I've never made one before. It's pretty good. I really like this drink, i got to yeah. say. I like it. It's really good. It's, uh, it, it's, it's crazy. Um, let's, uh, do we, well, let's not talk about Ports of Call. Next year. I think, yeah, next time. <laughs> uh, let's move on to questions and answers. Do we have time for, for a couple? Sir. Uh, do you have anything about the history of the gin pennant? In terms of oh, that they would fly to say that we're, we're serving gin? Uh, that was part of the, the also the Royal Navy thing. Uh, when there, there were definitely uh, uh, appointed times to make calls between the ships, and they'd fly the pennant to say that that was the case. But I don't have specific stuff on it right, right here. I, 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 that's the kind of thing. I would have to go home and look up. <laughs> On, the, uh, on another boat, then they were responsible for taking care of your... That sounds quite possible. That sounds like the kind of thing that people who had been drinking a bunch of gin in the wardroom might come up with. <laughs> yes? I heard at a great job in London that uh, Admiral Nelson wasn't uh, encased in a, a case of, uh, uh, of rum. It was brandy because the officers always drank brandy. The tars drank rum. That's, I think that's probably uh, true. But there's also another reason is they were on the Spanish station and they provisioned locally. So the, the, they didn't make a lot of rum in Spain. They made a lot of brandy. So it was, uh, you know, the, they, they would call in. I suspect it was a, keg, a, 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 a barrel of brandy. Yeah, but if it, he was definitely put in some kind of barrel. Well, the, the Oxford, uh, Oxford companion to seafaring actually had um, br uh, brandy slash rum, because they were divided on the issue. So you're absolutely right. It's like, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, so the, the last of the black top that's out there, the original rum that the British Navy used, the story is that it was blended rum coming from all the English islands, Jamaica, Guyana, Barbados. Is that true? Yes. Case? Yeah, because they, they bought, you know, they, they, it, was a, it was the government purchasing. And how does the government purchase stuff? They've got to spread it around to all the constituencies. So all the, all the various British uh, 
rum producers. During World War II, they had to actually add South African rum, and yes. that made everyone miserable yeah. because it tasted horrible. Because they used that for... Yeah. 1970? That's what they say, but that was that was from maybe the first time they issued rum. There was no there was no brand, you know. Pusser's was was that that's marketing. It's not actually the history of the Pusser's brand. Pusser's bought the right to call it Pusser's rum. Pusser was the purser of the ship who bought the who bought and was in charge of curating the rum supplies. Not bought, but who who, who watched over it, and uh, they bought the right to call it from the Royal Navy. Uh, to call it Pusser's Rum, but they didn't use the same suppliers or, or really the same blend, as far as we know. I mean, I've, I've tasted uh, the. There is some of the original stuff floating around. A, a very, how, how yeah, do you like it? it's fine. It's not the best rum in the world. It's fine. <laughs> it's strong. It's, it's not. A thousand dollar rum, right? not it is because it, be, it is because of what it represents, but not on its own. It's it's fine. Next question. Yes, in the back. Uh, minor compared to buying cannons and uh, you know compared to, to I mean it was it was not like it was not their biggest expense let's say uh, liquor was a lot cheaper in the 19th century and did, uh, up until fairly recently you know they probably didn't have to pay taxes on it either so uh, but it was you know they bought a lot of rum there was a lot of rum given out but uh, every day but uh, it was. It was. It wasn't uh, one of the major expenses of the Royal Navy. Not compared to like uh, armor plate and stuff like that. That's really expensive. Yes, sir. Yeah. I have a question. Is there documentation about the wood used for the first barrel aging, or did they experiment as well with different types of wood back in the days? Or uh, we don't know. They they used oak. Uh, that's all we know. Uh, they, they there was like they would use charred oak if the rum was. Uh, was was wrong. <laughs> Tasting charred oak would maybe fix it, but mostly it was uncharred and it was uh, uh, English oak. I don't think they used wine barrels for it. But I wish I knew. I mean, that's the kind of detail that history really uh, very rarely supplies. Mr. Curtis, do you have any wisdom on this? Well, if you don't, then we can move on. Yeah. To yeah. <laughs> All right. Fair enough. Anybody else? Uh, how was the grog? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Watery. Yeah. yeah, the last one wasn't better. Yeah, well, we didn't, we didn't, we didn't trust you. That's the problem. <laughs> the, the next person who complains gets flogged. That's right. <laughs> All right, how was the grog? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, uh, please uh, please send, it in, send in your feedback. Uh, and, uh, you know, you all are uh, mustered out of the Navy now, and uh, you may return to civilian life, hopefully improved by this experience at hard labor. Best of luck to you all. Best of luck to you all. Thank you.